Um, if you will, turn to 1 John chapter 5. That's where we are on our reading. And that'll finish up uh, 1 John. And then um, I don't know that we'll have time to, to study 2 and 3 John as a group together, but we'll try. It just depends on our time. So Doug will next week, if you will, just read both first, 2 John and 3 John next week. And then that'll get us back in 1 John, and we'll read it again. So chapter 5 of 1 John. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the, is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is sin not leading to death. Verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Amen. So as you can see, chapter 5 is a good conclusion of what we've been talking about, about faith and love and the faith and keeping the commandments. So when we get there, we, we've got a lot of discussion um, to talk about. Um, so last week we talked about chapter 3, the first 15 verses, talked about uh, the sin and, and the children of God, and we talked about the... Um, continuing in sin is not of God. And then we talked about um, the love that, that is shown, you know, and, and we concluded with 15, love wants the best in every situation. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 teaches. So if we can learn to love more, we're going to have a foundation that we can do God's commandments. And that's the basis of the fellowship that John is trying to teach us. But let's talk about tonight, verses 16 through chapter 4, verse 1. Um, my particular translation, which is the New, America, the New King James Version, it breaks the chapter, or the context, back up in 24 and puts it with, with uh, verse 1. Um, I, I kind of think that 
verse 1 of chapter 4 is kind of the conclusion of chapter 3. So um, we'll try to get through that as we discuss tonight. So if you will think about this particular text, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24, I think it gives us the fundamental tools, if you will, to have that fellowship with God, to have that fellowship with each other, to have that attitude that we're not going to continue to sin. And it's summarized in one word. It's the outpouring, and here's the word, of love. The outpouring of love. What is the outpouring of love? Are y'all tired of hearing my coffee example? Uh, I, thanks. You can probably tell it. That's the picture I get. When my grandmother poured that coffee out of the cup and it poured over into the saucer, that is the outpouring, and that's what the outpouring of love would be. Jerry, I'll come up with a new example, okay? Um, so let, let's read these texts. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But who ever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love the world or in let us not love in word or in tongue, but in indeed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if your heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And in this his commandments, that we should believe on the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now who, who, now who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the Spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. So if we're, if we're, we're thinking about the outpouring love this context could be a rehabilitation. It could be a rehab. It could be an improving for us as Christians. How do we improve on something? How do we become a better Bible student, a better Bible school teacher, a better, if you're a man and you lead a public prayer, how do we become a better prayer, if you will? Or how do we get better at Making a cake. How do we get better at repetition. repetition? Absolutely. I heard practice. Somebody said practice. Repetition and practice. We always are trying to do it, right? Um, do we ever get to the point that we cannot improve? Not this side of heaven. <laughs> this side of heaven. I concur. We always have to strive to improve no matter what we're doing, right? So if we're thinking about the outpouring love of God, and we see in verse 16, by this we know love. How do we know love? Because He laid down His life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives before the brethren. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, right? And then what, is, what does it teach after that? That He gave His only begotten Son, right? Turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 8.
The context here actually starts in um, verse 6. And, and it's teaching that Christ in our place instead of us. Verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for... What's the next word? Change it to two letters and put M-E there. And let's think about that. Christ died for me. That's not doing any injustice to Romans, right? When Paul taught this, he was saying he died for everybody. Do we have enough love outpouring tonight to die for someone? I would venture to say that we do in a certain classification. We would probably say our spouses, our children, our family, we'd be first in line, wouldn't we? But would you die for your enemy? Would you die for somebody that cheated you out of money, out of some money yesterday? What do you think? That, that's a little tougher to answer, isn't it? I mean, a, lot of, a lot of you are, are like, I, I don't think so. I would think about it, you know. I'm trying to want to do that. I'm trying to want to have enough love that I would die for that sinner. I don't know that I could. Heather, Blake, or Maddie, Michaela, my family, I would be first in line. I'd say, yep, let's go. I can handle it. But Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died because God had outpouring love for me. So when we think about the love and we think about the fellowship that we're trying to do in 1 John, um, that's what he's teaching us in verse 16. And uh, so if you... If you're taking notes or if you're writing your Bible, a, a good cross-reference here is Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Actually, all the way down to about verse 20. But that gives um, a good definition because God gave us the avenue of the separation from sin or death, if you will, in life. Death and life. Because he's, He has put a separation there, and He has made it appear, He has made it, He has made it a law that that's the way it has to be. It, ha it can't be both. Questions or comments? So verse 17 gets us into a situation that we have to have some action. But whoever has the world's goods, what is the world's goods? Possessions. Possessions. Would you classify the world's richest or the world being rich here? I don't think so. I think we all have the world's goods, right? Food and water and shelter. So we, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need. Dan Winkler says the word sees here is connecting the dots. You figure out what the needs are and you take care of them. That, made a, that makes sense to me. So if we connect the dots, our brother is in need and shuts up his heart... From him, how does the love of God abide in him? How does the love of God abide in us if we don't share the world's goods? What does James 2.16 teach us? Be ye warm and filled. I can say that to everybody I see. I can say it right now. Let's go outside and I'll say, be warm and filled. 
You going to be warm? Probably not. Now, if I say be warm and filled and I give you a, a, some kind of hat and some gloves and a, a layers of clothing, a jacket, a coat, actions, right? So what does all this have to do with fellowship? Our attitude, we should be ready to die for everyone. And now we've got the world's goods and we've closed up our heart. So what does this have to do with fellowship? Here's what I think. 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Nobody is going to care how many words you say unless there's some action behind it, right? I'll give you $100 to come and mow my yard. Anybody in? That's probably a pretty good offer. I would, I would, I would pay that. You come and mow my yard, I don't pay you. You coming back? No, right? So we have to have actions. <laughs> we have to have actions in order for us to have the outpouring of love. Absolutely. Claude said that it's easy to say I love you to someone. It's, it's easy to say those words. But it, it takes a little bit more effort to find the details and carry them out, right? So now that we're in, the, we think about love, how does the love of God abide in Him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know we are of the truth. How do we know that we love? How do we know that we love? Because we demonstrate it. We demonstrate it. Claude said we demonstrate it. We show it. We have those actions. We know that we love in deed and in truth that we are in the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Is it wrong to be confident? We need to be confident. I, I don't think it's wrong either. We need to be confident. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to check you. I think you're right, too. Well, well, 2 Timothy, verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. By God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we have to stir it up. We have to be confident. So... How do we become confident to show an outpouring love of God? How do we become confident enough that we know that? It's tough sometimes. Would confidence be that you buy a meal for a family that you see on the side of the road? Could that, could that strengthen my confidence? I think it could in this realm. Because I don't immediately think that I'm going to be burnt or used or they don't want to just take the money or whatever. So I'm thinking of the best. So if we're loving, having the outpouring of love, we're going to think the best, right? We always think the best in every situation. So... Um, verse 19, And by this we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before Him. 
For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So let's spend a little time here in the next two verses. What does it mean when the text says our heart condemns us? That's right. And the heart is not this desire here. It's this stuff here. That's right. God said that it's the internal conscience that God gave us. It's our conscience is why that we can read these words if our heart condemns us. Can we train our conscience? Sure. We, we can. Absolutely we can. So if the text is teaching that it says we are... If our heart condemns us, that's going to show some guilt, right? It's going to show that we're not doing what we're supposed to do. So it has to be, the question has to be answered, what's the standard? If we can train our conscience, we can train our love ability, we can make it better, what's the standard? How do we do that? Mm -hmm. we violated that. God said that, that if our heart condemns us that we've broke something we, we know that was right we've broke it I agree with that the answer is in the same verse let's look at it again God is greater than our heart and he knows, here's our word again, all things. So the standard has to be God. So if we're trying to improve love, and we're trying to improve our attitudes, and we're trying to improve the Christian life, we're trying to be better every time that we do something, our conscience has to be God's standard. It has to measure up to God's standard. If not... We're not, we're, we're not having that outpouring of love. So the next verse. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Let's discuss that a little bit. What is that talking about? If your heart does not condemn you, you have confidence toward God. What's it teaching us? Is it not teaching that the pure conscience, it's, it's clean, and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're living like God's had, you're keeping His commandments? Is it that simple? Go ahead, Donald. Well, like you said, that's what the test is. I we can
That's right. Absolutely. Uh, Donald's saying that this scripture, this context, these verses are is, is training us to love. It's teaching us the actions that we do. He gave the example that if we invest in someone, that's when we don't want to start loving them. Because it's sometimes not easy to do. It's not easy for me to go up to someone and say, I love you and here's why. It, but, but Paul's teaching that it's improvement, but he's also teaching to Christians. When, Paul, sorry. John, when John wrote this, using God's words, he said, this is improvement. This is to Christians and you already have heard it. Yes, Claude. Sure, absolutely. Hey, Clyde asked the question, um, the confidence toward God, the confidence in God, does that not show that we're d trying to do what He wants us to do? Does that not show that we're trying to do His commandments? I agree, absolutely. Absolutely. Confidence is a great motivator. Agree or disagree? It, is confidence greater than fear? Fear is a good motivator. Fear is a really good motivator. Fear of a discipline of some kind, fear of loss of some kind, it's a great motivator. But it, it tends to go away. You get less scared each time. Absolutely. It's more sustainable, more rewarding, absolutely. So we look at this and we say, Beloved, if your heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. So we're learning now the attitude that we could die for someone, right? That's the outpouring love. We're trying in this context to improve. I'm not trying to say it's going to be easy. It's actually going to be really hard. How do we love the unlovable? Work. <laughs> Clyde said work. And he, he kind of laughed a little bit, but he's, he, he's dead serious. Right? It takes a lot of work. Those of you that are married, Mason, don't answer this question yet. Do you love your spouse more today than you did yesterday? You don't have to answer it out loud if you don't. I'm just teasing. But it, it, it's taken some work, right, to get to this point that you can say, you know, yeah, I do love more today. In order to have the confidence that we have to do God's commandments, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of knowledge, but it takes us putting the dots together, if you will. Verse 17, But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need shuts up his heart for him... How does the love of God abide in him? So we have to pay attention, right? We have to understand. So um, let's pause right there just a minute, and we'll pick up in uh, 22 in, in a couple of minutes. Yes, sir.
extra fellowship. There are certain people that we have fellowship with. Well, that's our brothers and sisters. And uh, this, I think this is one of the things that John was trying to get across is that we are to love our brothers and sisters. It's not just a feeling. It's easy to say, I have a feeling toward someone. But this, this love is not just a feeling. This, this love is when we actually respond in some way to our brothers and sisters. Uh, when we talk about seeing the person on the side of the road that is may have needs, what about our brothers and sisters? We, we assume they don't have needs. If you think about this congregation, we probably assume that nobody in this congregation has a need. That's probably not the case. And if we see our brother and sister have a need, uh, this is, I think, what John is talking about. Those with whom we have fellowship, when they have a need, the rest of us, should bear, yet bear the burden of that need. Absolutely. I'm not talking about a need that they have that has come about because of their own carelessness and things of that nature. Sure. But when we talk about uh, seeing our brother and sister in need, when we have uh, the world's good, when we shut up our hearts against a brother and sister, and we do not have help them, that to me is the epitome of love when we love our family mm -hmm. and we have to take care of our family but when we do that we can have confidence towards God and our heart is not going to condemn us because we take care of one another <laughs> and we help one another uh, and, but, and I understand that it might be the case that within any congregation people don't want to talk about what they might have need of mm -hmm. or they might be struggling uh, might be a relative context of the world as it existed at that time, people had needs physically. And if you go back all the way to the book of Acts, the brothers and sisters were helping their brothers. They were selling what they need, had, and they were helping their brothers and sisters. And they had confidence before God that they were actually loving their brothers and sisters. It's one thing to talk about loving your brother. But it's another thing to demonstrate that love uh, in some way. Absolutely. I try to summarize what he said. He, he put it in context, back in the context of fellowship. And it's talking to brothers and sisters. And it, we've got to find those needs. And our congregation is their needs today. You know, and sometimes people don't want to talk about those needs. But we have to be able to invest in and, and, and Ken said that we have to be able to show the actions and it it's, goes back to Acts. It goes all the way back to the New Testament. The very first congregation of the Lord's people, they were helping one another and then their conscience was clean because it, they were doing God's word. They were doing the truth and that's how we love our brothers and sisters. Yes, sir. That's right. Uh, in view of our fellowship with one another, uh, it, it should not be as difficult for us to do what we need to do towards one another. Uh, it, there, there are going to be maybe opportunities uh, in, in, in our dealings 
with one another and some <coughs> difficulties that arises, that, that's the time we've got to love one another. Uh, Jesus told the disciples, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. And that's not just a feeling. That's just not saying I love you. That is acting in a way that is characteristic of how Christ acted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's think about, we, we're talking about love, we're talking about the context of fellowship, and we've got really good discussion. Let's, let's look at John's words, and let's think about the word love, and let's think about it. It is more than just a feeling. Ken has said that a couple of times. It's more than just saying, I love you, or that feeling, that, we, that warm, fuzzy feeling. It is actions, and it is things that we have to do. And it doesn't necessarily... Uh, have to be hard so let's look at some principles about love in first john first john chapter 2 verse 5 chapter 5 verse 2 and 3 this principle is shown keeping god's word is the proof that we love god so if we keep god's word Chapter 2, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 2, and 3. That is the proof that we love God. Another principle. When we love our brother, we will live without stumbling. We will live without causing him to stumble. Um, again, chapter 2, verse 10. If we are not to love the world, we, we don't love the world or the things of the world. So we can't love God and we can't love the world. Chapter 2, verse 15. God's love promoted Him to make us His children through the death of His Son. Chapter 3, verse 1, again in verse 16. Chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. So the principle that God has set forth of loving is a lot more than just the feeling in it. If He loved us enough that He gave us His Son and His Son died for us, it's a lot more than a feeling. Another principle that we learn, chapter 3, verse 11, 16, 23, chapter 4, verse 7, 11, and, and verse 12. Loving others, loving other believers is a fundamental requirement of Christian life. So if we love our brothers and sisters to the point that we actually do some actions for them, that is the principle that's the foundation of a Christian life. When we say, yes, I've, I've heard, I've understood the words, I confess, I repent, and I am baptized, and you come out of that water and you understand that the love for our Christian brothers and sisters is a fundamental act of my Christian life, that is a great way to start being a Christian, isn't it? I think those verses and that principle is the context of the love and the fellowship that we're trying to talk about and learn from 1 John. Because if we don't have it there... We're never going to have it, are we not? It, it has to be a fundamental requirement. So let's talk about those two words. What's fundamental? The basis. Foundation. We, when I played basketball, we had to dribble with our head up. We had to have our hand on top of the basketball. And we were playing defense with our hands up and not out and not reaching. Fundamentals, right? Shot free throws the, from the fifth grade till I graduated. I shot the free throw the exact same way. My coach told me when I shot him 99%, made 99 out of every 100, I could shoot him any way I wanted to. We did it his way. Fundamentals, right? Fundamentals. Who is the football coach? I know you've heard it held up a football. Green Bay. Who? Lombardi, thank you. Hells up a football. 
to a professional group of men and says, this is a football. So if we take the love principle and we say this is the foundation, what are we doing? We're getting back to that fundamental, right? The fundamental way to live a Christian life. Another principle is found in chapter 3, verse 10, verse 14, chapter 4, verse 8, and verse 20. A failure to love other Christians raises serious questions about the genuineness of your faith. If we don't love our brothers and sisters, do we have a strong faith? I don't see how we can with what we're studying in this context, right? So if we're genuine and we have faith that's trying to grow, we are doing a, we, it, it, it demands that we have fellowship with our brothers and sisters. The whole book of 1 John is teaching these two fundamentals. Another, another, um, another attribute for our Christian life, genuine love always results in action, not just sentimental words. Chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Another principle about love is God is the source of that love. Chapter 4, verse 7 and 16. Mature love does not produce fear, but instead it produces courage. Chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Long before that we love God, he loved us first. Genesis 3 talks about the separation of, the, of, of death and life. Romans 5, 8 says that he gave his son for me. In that whole context in Romans chapter 5, and actually Romans 5 all the way down into verse 6, is teaching that concept. So long before we loved God, he loved us. Chapter 4 verse 19. So, the fundamental foundation that we have to have in verses 16 through 24 is love your brothers and sisters, love Christians, and put some action to it. Now, uh, verse 22. And whatever we ask, we're, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of Jesus, on His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Now He who keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in Him, and by this we know that He abides in us, by the Spirit whom He has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many of them are false prophets have gone out into the world. So we are trying to think about love and fellowship, and now it's saying, whatever you ask, He's going to give to you. This is, in our world, unfortunately, a misuse of a scripture. Well, just whatever you ask, He's going to give it to you. Notice what he says after that. Because we keep his commandments. Our conscience, that's that outpouring of love, is going to guide our thoughts and our prayers in accordance to God's will. We're not going to ask for something that we know that's against God's will, right? So... Now that because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Sometimes when I study, I overlook little words, maybe insignificant words. Let's talk about the word do. What does that mean? Go do the dishes. What am I going to do? 
there's some action. Right? I've got to get them in a the dishwasher. I've got to wash them. I've got to do something with them. So what does the word do? Do those things that are pleasing in his sight. It shows action, does it not? And it shows the action that we have to have the outpouring love to have that fellowship with our Christian brothers and sisters. And then in verse 1 of chapter 4, it says at the end, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we're, if our conscience is clean and we're trying to do what we're supposed to do, we're going to know those false prophets, right? We'll get in more detail in chapter 4 next week. I just want us to think about verse 24. He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. So our conscience is driven by Jesus, driven by the truth. So that's where all the fellowship and the outpouring of love. Thank you very much. We'll pick up there next week.